Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. So it is lovely traditional Sunday morning live. I've been doing this for a few years now, so it's an awesome tradition that I'm keeping alive. And I mean, as long as situations permit. But yeah, it's been 50 days since my last period or menstruation. So that's I would say pretty revolutionary because it is one day extra than the last time that I have time in between my menstruation. So, all right. So good morning, Bridget. I see ya. But um, yeah, I've been looking at the uh, the vaccine argument and the vaccine debate and This is what even non-vaxxers, this is what mothers have to understand, is that no matter how you get the immunity, okay, immunity equals antibody. Antibody equals mutation, okay? So no matter how you get immunity per se, it actually works against the body. It is um, uh, upset of homeostasis that causes inflammation and when something when you see yourself get sick or react to something that's a slight mutation and so that is why they require these vaccines because since there's so many diseases and who knows where they came from I mean I can speculate and say that biotech is creating them only because I know that you don't catch 24 different strains of the measles in the dirt and the body doesn't just materialize disease, 24 different strains out of nowhere. And so in a potentially the reason why 24 different strains exist is because it hits different biochemistries. But here's the thing why would someone then go and test and capture the 24 different strains? Because even one strain, you know, okay, so someone gets that one strain and they have an antibody. That's the reason why you get a titer test or get a vaccine to show proof that you are protected. But why would then, why would then they discover the 24 different strains? And why would they even test for it to begin with? Because the measles, even if you do, I mean, if it's called the measles and not some other different disease, you would have a symptom that would be very much like the measles. So it wouldn't red flag anyone to go test it unless somebody was looking to see the outcome of an experiment 24 different times. Because, yeah, I mean, when, yeah, when someone gets, um, test is positive for the measles and maybe there's a marker that it's you know measles type one and then they get then they get the measles again twice in our childhood and the doctors can't figure out why maybe that's the reason why and so they do tests and like oh yeah now this is measles type two well why do we have measles type two? Oh, because maybe somebody's biochemistry mixed it all up and then put it out i mean i could we could all speculate why there's 24 different types, but the measles isn't deadly. So when you look at the vaccine schedule and you look at all the lists of the different vaccines you get and the different diseases, they're not deadly. But when you get so many of these different types of pathogens and antibodies that turn into antibodies, when you get so many of them over a period of time, whether they space them out or they take them all together, that is accumulating natural killer cells. Okay, so why are natural killer cells slash antibodies slash T cells slash lymphocytes so dangerous? Well, because you wouldn't be mixing A, B, and O blood together. If an O negative person receives an AB positive blood type, it would destroy them because the antibodies, because the surface marker antigen that is in a blood type you do a blood transfusion, which is another hoax in the industry, but I mean, that's just my personal opinion. You get a blood transfusion and you're an O negative and you receive it from an, o or from an AB positive. That's antigen. 
what does antigen do in the body? It creates ant. It what does antigen do to inflict harm on the body? It creates antibodies. You know, I mean, ant. The, the reason why antibodies exist because you may just so happen be exposed to something in the air, okay? Or you may just be exposed to a conglomeration of elements such as radiation. Because when you get exposed to radiation, don't you know what happens? Yeah, you get inflammation. Okay, what is inflammation? When That's symptoms. What is symptoms? That is natural killer cells being created. Those are antibodies being created. So it does protect you temporarily. And then maybe you leave that polluted area, whatever that is, and you continue with your life. The body does recover, but now it's mutated. Even though you've sustained homeostasis, you're not in inflammation anymore. You're not sick. You don't feel sick. But the body does adapt. That's the adaptive and the innate immune system. So the innate immune, the innate immune system, you, um, you, you sustained a mutation. And the adaptive immune system adapts to those conditions. It finds a way to be able to live despite that mutation. Now, somebody may be able to repair that mutation relative to their belief system. Others don't repair those mutations. So every single time you get a vaccine or for those natural crunchy mamas, you expose your kid to the pathogen that came from that vaccine, that child, regardless if it's from a vaccine or measles party, they will then sustain that mutation. And that mutation does upset homeostasis. But now that mutation over time is going to then collect antibodies because now you have a lot of antibodies in your body playing pinball against all your systems. So why is it that those all of those lists of vaccines, why are they required? And why isn't the Ebola virus or the Ebola vaccine or the AIDS vaccine or what else? I'm thinking of some other deadly pathogens out there that we know about. The reason why they don't require you to be tested for AIDS or for the Ebola is because it's not contagious. It really must be introduced. And what happens is they say, oh yeah, the AIDS is contagious or something. Go get your vaccine. Those are pretty deadly viruses. Even if they weaken it, it would destroy people. And they, don't, they, they can't afford to destroy the population and induce a more serious outbreak than the measles. Getting the measles naturally, you know, I mean, relative to what you bring to the table, if you're already majorly immunocompromised and you're in the hospital and you're, on, and you're in hospice, being exposed to the measles virus could potentially kill you because your, your body is weak. It doesn't have the strength to, it, you know, it does have the strength to create antibodies, but those antibodies would kill the person. It's not about, you know, the immune system strong. The immune system is still strong no matter what, because anytime it's exposed to pathogens, it will create antibodies. But the difference of why someone dies in our system, regardless of what of what practices they practice and what they do, it's because those antibodies that were created put them finally over the edge. It was the last straw that broke the camel's back. So whether it be meditation that creates hormones, and let me go. Let me, let me uh, real quick go over the three things that kill people. A hormonal imbalance, too many natural killer cells, and then too much candida. So when you're always creating hormones, inducing hormones, regardless of where, what it is, whether it's an essential oil, whether it's an air freshener, whether it's cannabis, whether it's an antibiotic, whether it's a detox, whether it's a pill, powder, or supplement, because natural killer cells induce hormones. That is the natural reaction progression of why people die. Okay, now we can call them pathogens, we can call them contaminants, we can call them synthetic versus natural, but that's another smoke and mirrors in the industry. When they say something is natural versus synthetic, that's like an oxymoron because they're both natural. This earth, everything on earth is natural. You know, if you want to say that it's synthetic versus natural, synthetic is more poisonous for you. No, I mean, things that are natural in out there in Mother Nature can be just as poisonous as if something was made in a lab. It's just the same elements repackaged. 
and relative to what you bring to the table and relative to how it's processed, you may have a more poisonous type of conglomeration of elements versus another, but that's no different than taking large amounts of garlic versus taking a very, you know, small little pill that has like, you know, two milligrams versus like 20. You know, a pill in the in, in the pharmaceutical industry that only has one or two milligrams of something is far safer than taking loads of garlic. But guess what? One is synthetic and the other one is natural. And then that would be like, that would conflict against this party line of the GMO versus organic. You know, organic and GMO are really no different than each other. That's why I get away from the politics because it has you take on a platform that is all the same. There's no difference between Anavax and Provax. There's no difference between GMO and organic. There's no difference between, you know, for and against. Those arguments like really beget each other because the outcome is the same. So when somebody does test positive, I mean, they want to know, do you, did you get the measles shot? Yes, I did. Now they don't tell you what type of measles. They just said, Hey, we want to know if you got the MMR. Are you vaccinated against the measles? Now, if they start asking you the types of measles and you show on your titer test that you have measles number one, if they start asking you, well, we want to have a vaccine for measles number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, then that would made, be a major red flag because what the hell? Okay. I mean, this is what tells me, this is why when I was watching Big People, Little World or Big Little People, Big World on the TLC channel and there's, um, was there two? No, was there only one? There's only one dwarf. Okay, but let's say there's two dwarfs in one family. Well, those are different strains that then turned into dwarfism. Because, and then I looked up, you know, the different strains of dwarfism, and there are a bunch of different strains. So if there's only one strain that then turned into dwarfism, then you would only have one child in the family that would be a dwarf. Because what would happen is, the mother was exposed to that pathogen. Yes, it mutated the child and the child then became a dwarf. But the next time the mother had a baby, she would already be immune against that pathogen. It would have already mutated her body. And so she would pass that immunity on to her baby. That's why we don't have, you know, a dwarf population because the immune system is strong enough to fight against foreign objects that then cause mutations, cause the different handicaps and the different types of people out there. But the reason why now you have like, you know, a few kids that are autistic in the same family or a few dwarfs in the same family is because there's different strains. And the reason why you get the measles, even after you were vaccinated, because they say, oh yeah, vaccines, you know, they're not 100% because, you know, this vaccine, you know, this antibody is only for this strain when there's 50 other zillion strains out there. So what are you going to, so what's the human point? But you, would you be taking 24 different vaccines, even in a course of a child's lifetime? Would that even make sense? And if you did that, you'd destroy the child. So this whole thing with the vaccines, but no different than natural immunity. Putting your kids in a measles parties is just as dangerous as going to the to the pharmacist or the doctor and getting injected. Because anytime you induce antibodies, it will then, you know, obviously build up and create autoimmunity as well as induce hormones. And hormones, when you are constantly triggering your hormones, it then puts you on a death trajectory. So that's why I want you guys to also stop using the word plant-based lifestyle because that's so vague and it's so broad and then people don't understand the distinctions because there are some plants that are very, very antibiotic, create antibodies and induce hormones and then guess what? It destroys them. Vegans and vegetarians and the whole meditation community that doesn't bring in jelly juice, they're all dying. They're all aging. I mean, look at the monks up there, you know, the Buddhist monks out there in Nepal or Tibet. You know, look at the Dalai Lama. 
they're dying? I mean, do you think their practices is everlasting eternal life or are they living for the afterlife? When you're living for the afterlife, you have a misalignment with your body, mind, and spirit. So this is why I would like for you guys to be very, very educated in this and not to make such broad generalizations about how it's a plant-based therapy or plant-based lifestyle versus a carnivore-based. Because plant-based therapies and plant-based people who are vegans and vegetarians are absolutely no different as far as their biochemistry than a carnivore. Because being skinny can be just as malnourished as someone that is over obese. And then we have all these different beauty practices that hide and deceive people on what's going on on the inside until the body can't lie anymore, until plastic surgery can't lie anymore. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the whole thing with the vaccines, and I'm still looking at, you know, crunchy mamas and whoever giving elderberry syrup to their children. You know, that, that has antibiotics in it, for one. It has vast amounts of sugar, fruit sugar, that feed the candida cancer, and the different ingredients create natural killer cells, like the ginger and the turmeric and the honey, because it's all antibiotic and it feeds candida but it also creates hormones. So yeah, when, when you give a kid Ritalin, or lately I've been drinking a lot of coffee because I'm dealing with healing symptoms myself, but when you give a kid a Ritalin, you know, that's a hormone. When you're trying to calm your adrenaline in your child, what do they do? They drug them. What is drugging somebody? That's giving them a hormone to balance them out. So you go from one extreme to the other, not understanding the balance because they don't look at balance over there in the allopathic holistic world. They're all about saying, oh yeah, you have this one behavior. Well, let's take this drug or this supplement or this pill or this therapy and we'll go throw, you know, the balance off your body, induce a hormone, whatever it is, and maybe you'll level out. And then the kid's just like a zombie because the drugs, you know, versus some kind of antibiotic or some kind of pill powder and supplement, is probably 10 times as stronger. I mean, the pill powder supplement and the natural um, drugs they have there in the holistic world is just as bad. But when you start bringing in pharmaceuticals, they're bringing in the big guns. They're taking in, um, you, God, I mean, DNA and, and other types of things that then create a target and then induce a specific hormone. No different than Viagra. Why do men take Viagra? Because they stop getting hard. Well, guess what? There's specific elements in Viagra that target the male reproductive system and have a specific outcome. So it's a very, 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 you know, technical, highly advanced recipe that has a specific outcome that is zeroing in on the male reproductive system to then have a specific outcome, which is four hours Okay, that's not good for anybody. So, um, so yeah, so that's what, you know, that's what the holistic and the allopathic do. They just, it's, it's, they're no different than each other. It's just repackaging of the hormones. Okay, so, you know, I've been dealing with some um, healing symptoms and I've started this protocol like 2016 or 20, yeah, 2016 in October. And uh, I've gone through layers and layers and layers of healing. And so in the beginning, my first healing process or the healing symptoms was losing the water weight and shrinking my fat cells. And then my skin was really dry. I had to use, you know, certain oils out there that were, you know, that helped break through all of the extra excess skin because it was just so dry. And because coconut oil wasn't doing it. Now I don't use any oils at all. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I use like link argon oil and avocado oil that I went to the holistic store to get just to kind of help me get through because the juice, you know, it, it does a little bit, but when you're really trying to heal and you're trying to maintain, I don't know, some relief from some of the skin issues, I did turn to a few things because, you know, out of just, you know, not knowing, but it did help me. But, um, I did go through, you know, the, a lot of yeast infections. I did go through 
hemorrhoids, flare-ups. I did go through a lot of constipation because I wasn't doing a lot of waterfalls in the beginning. I started doing the waterfalls towards the middle. And then what else? I mean, the mental clarity, the brain fog, the fatigue. Now, I mean, and, and it's, it's a lot of different layers. I had skin issues come up, rashes, headaches. I mean, you name it, my body was healing. I was going through it. Now I am seeing a difference in my reproductive system. And so that's why I keep counting down that it's like 50 days since my last period because I'm trying to reach amenorrhea. Because the reason why amenorrhea is so important is because it tells people, you know, it tells mothers that have children if the kids have amenorrhea and they're like 16 or 17 and they never had a period, don't take them to the doctor to get their period. Guess what the doctors do? They give them injections or give them pills. They give them hormones. And when you induce hormones, it puts you on a death trajectory. You may not die right then and there, but when you start getting your period, it's the body's red flag to say, okay, there's a certain amount of time you have on this earth. We will give you a certain amount of time to go and procreate and keep the species alive. So right now, I'm trying to now reverse that. Yes, I got my period at 13 and then had a lot of reproductive issues ever since then. But now as I'm on the protocol and I'm still eating, I'm not like on the diet 100% because there's no diet for me to be able to be having at this point. I'm pretty much healed and sealed. So I can introduce foods in the diet that is off the protocol without going into inflammation. But when you are in the process of healing and you reintroduce foods too early, then you go into inflammation, you get mucus because your body isn't healed yet to be able to handle the onslaught of poison. So you have to let your body heal. And when your body finally gets to fight off that stuff and release the stuff that's excess, it's now in the healing process. So that's why you stay on the diet. So you cannot induce antibodies to then undermine you. So with me trying to induce amenorrhea, it's not because I'm underweight or only have 4% fat and I'm not eating anything. No, it's because my body is finally at its maximum um, metabolism and the nut nutrients versus pathogens or hormones are all balanced. I mean, it's like, was it the debt to ratio, debt to income ratio is perfect. Right, so that's kind of what my body is in, is is a perfect debt to income ratio. Yeah. So, you know, so that's why you know, so so hitting amenorrhea now is because I'm in a different context. I'm my body's finally realizing that I'm not killing it, so it doesn't need to reproduce. So it does affect behaviors. Like I'll still, I mean, I can still pull up hormones when I need to. But it's just no different than taking incense once in a while. It's no different than going to an amusement park once in a while. It's no different than eating off the protocol once in a while. So I've balanced out to where I will induce a hormone once a week. Okay. So which means, and will that still put me on a death trajectory? I don't think so. People say, oh, you know, I was thinking like, oh, if I, you know, if I do this activity that induces a hormone once a week, shaking the tree, will that then induce menstruation? It hasn't happened yet. I mean, December 8th was my last period and I'm now 50 year or 50 years, 50 days in between. So I'm looking at, you know, um, my once a week inducing a hormone practice is no different than eating, uh, eating gluten, gluten free, eating a donut once in a while. But as long as I have my juice and I'm drinking, it has the nutrients. It has the lactobacillus. I'm home free. So it's just a matter of, you know, how much more good that I'm doing that's bad. But that's why you have to understand the distinctions of what's good and bad. I'm not saying bad is in the sense that you don't ever, ever partake because, you know, you need hormones in your body to balance everything out because cells rely on hormones. Every single nutrient creates and then balances your hormones. Every single one of those foods, every single nutrient, when you compartmentalize nutrients in the supplements, that then throws the hormones off balance. When you're taking in a synthetic or natural hormone, whether it's desiccated pig cells in thyroid medication or some other synthetic thyroid medication, you're taking in a hormone that's throwing the balance off the body because you're compartmentalizing and you're taking in something that the body really can't balance out correctly. So yeah, it's going to start destroying you. You're going to see glaucoma. You're going to see your different 
parts of your body just deteriorate because the amount of hormones you're taking in on a daily basis. I mean, they have people thinking that you're going to die without the hormones, without taking the thyroid medication. No, your body is going to eventually regrow that organ, that thyroid, or your pancreas, and fix your endocrine system so you can balance out the hormones. But no, they have people thinking that they'll die if they don't take their hormones, they don't take these certain things. But no different than any addiction, when you take in any drug, and it's all hormone inducing, no matter what it is, and you're addicted to a drug, yes, there'll be a period of time where you're going to be then needing to have it, but then eventually you'll wean off. But you never just completely get off drugs, cold turkey, no different than it's, you know, than transitioning. Um, and so that's why I say some of you, you know, th that are very addicted to whatever, you know, and you feel you're addicted and, and you need to maintain a certain semblance of normalcy so you can go about your daily business, then, you know, drink the juice, do what you got to do. You have to drink coffee, you have to take your drugs, you have to do whatever you got to do, that's fine. But then eventually your intention is to then wean off those addictions, whatever they are, because that's not your intention is to stay addicted. That's what's destroying you. Taking hormones, taking things that induce natural killer cells that induce hormones kills you. So, you know, that's the thing with um, the spicy foods and the stress. You know, when people are addicted to spicy food, it causes stress on the body. Guess what? It causes natural killer cells. And that's why it's so addictive because then the hormones come into play. So, you know, it's, that's why I find it very funny when, when something as benign as a spicy food, right? But it's not benign at all. It's a drug. Spicy foods are a drug. It's an anti-inflammatory. It tries to um, get rid of inflammation, the natural killer cells. You know what it does? It induces a hormone. So then it relieves those natural killer cells from from coming to surface. So that's why people say, oh yeah, take cayenne pepper when you're asthmatic or take this garlic oil or some cannabis CBD oil to get rid of the tumors or cancer. So just because you got rid of cancer or you've lessened the amount of natural killer cells that are present during inflammation doesn't mean that you helped your body. You just took a hormone, which then yes, it does make numbers go down and it does disappear certain symptoms. But guess what? You're now creating a hormonal imbalance. And then those hormones are present. No different than getting your kids ears pierced or getting circumcision. You know, any trauma to the body without it being repaired, it will have then a, a predominant hormone present. And then, of course, the lifestyle of the child or the adult when you get tattoos. Those create hormones too. That's why people are addicted to tattoos. Pain is pleasure, you hear in the BDSM world. Well, you know, when you bring up those types of uh, hormones on a continuous basis, yeah, you know, it's fun. That's why we have so many different activities out there that people gravitate towards. It's fun to play with your hormones. It's fun to feel fear, pain, adrenaline, all of these things. But then you start seeing the decay of the human population. And of course, then they become fertile so they can then keep the species moving forward, keep filling in these positions at certain jobs. And then that's kind of just our life out here. So you study every single pleasurable activity out there that people chase after and pay good money for. It's all hormone all hormone therapy, meditation without being coupled with jelly juice is inducing hormones. The holistic community is huge on playing with hormones, but they don't call it hormone replacement therapy. They don't call it, they call it spiritual. They call it healing. Anything that has healing attached to it, you know, it can be a double-edged sword, rel sword relative to the context. But whenever you hear the word spiritual, that equals hormones. Now, I'm telling you, there's a few people out there that will not at all like understand that because they still want to look at spiritual as like talking to a higher power, your maker, your creator, ascension, a different universe. And okay, I get the different context of spiritual, but spiritual has a meaning. It is playing with your hormones. The body, mind, and spirit 
the spirit is relative to the nutrition that you're taking relative to the health or the unhealth of your body and your mind. So of course your spirit's gonna be either mutated or very well balanced. Well, what is that? That's also hormones. Your hormones are gonna be either very well balanced or completely mutated with one hormone more dominant than the other. And that's why I say when somebody is um, drinking alcohol, relative to the alcohol content will be then showing you which hormone is present. And some people react to certain types of alcohols, like clear alcohol would then trigger someone to be mean versus a dark alcohol or a um, or just beer, which makes them all fun. Okay, so you know when when you do take a lot of different natural killer cells and that which is you know poisons um, because it's natural killer cells get created from poisons. So really hard grain alcohol, clear or even dark will then create natural killer cells, which can then do a hormone, which is what you see in a behavior when somebody is drinking. And that's why they also don't have the reflexes. That's why drunk driving is not okay. That's why driving under any influence of any drug is not okay. Yes, Joaquin. Oh yeah, the spiritual is insane because it's another, it's another category that they can dress up and make it to where it's like a nice, it's unassuming, non-threatening, and it sounds lovely because what it's doing too when you're when you're being spiritual, you're tapping into the oxytocin. So you have these mediums or these types of people who are always inducing oxytocin. They're so loving. They're probably some of the massage therapists that are out there that have this healing touch. Because you don't want someone that's high on adrenaline touching your body, right? Because then you feel that crazy chaos. But being so loving and so, oh, let me touch you, let me feel you, all this other type of stuff, that can be just as damaging. But it's it's the pleasure. People respond more to pleasure than they do to the pain and the chaos. But it's still, um, it's still an imbalance. That's where the whole thing with the empaths, the empaths are always so sensitive and they're so loving because when someone is dubbed an empath, they have a huge amount of oxytocin present. But remember, drugs are deceiving. So people will defend their lovey-dovey empathic background with the meditation and the massage and the Reiki and all of this stuff. You know, if someone is going to practice any type of Reiki massage or any type of of um, hormone manipulation to then manage cancer disease and chronic illness, you know, you really want them, first of all, to be 100% well, for one. But number two, you got to do something to then keep those hormones at bay so they don't overtake you and then destroy you. Because when you're manipulating a body, either doing Reiki, you're bringing up negative energy, you're bringing up negative, you're bringing up hormones, you're bringing up pathogens. I mean, that's what it is. When you're doing Reiki, you're doing some kind of lymph node or some kind of like shiatsu massage, you're releasing all the pathogens that are in the lymph nodes because it's constipated. And now it's released throughout the body. And then guess what? The body then has to go and fight those poisons yet once again, because first they were corralled. All of those those pathogens that were stuck in your lymph nodes are now cor- were corralled. Maybe they would leave the body, but probably not. And so now they're free flowing again. And then your body's creating natural killer cells, which then induces hormones. And that's why massage therapy is so pleasurable for people because that's what's going on. And that's why it's painful for some massage. And then it, then it, then it feels great. And my husband loves feet massage and hand massage and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to kill you, Jason. I really don't. <laughs> I mean, that is a trippy way of the approach of it. But yeah, but that's what it is. Because when you're always inducing pleasure, you're inducing hormones. Okay. So very good, Joaquin. Yeah. I mean, the spiritual, you know, is, is a dangerous thing. Anyone that dubs himself a spiritual guide and they're saying, oh, you should do meditation without doing jelly juice at all. 
because the reason why you would do meditation is to help kind of alleviate the pain during the healing process, but it should never be something that you do predominantly. But you'd see, you know, I mean, because I have people from that I used to hang out with on Facebook think that drinking milk, like raw milk, is like good for you. No, milk is actually, here's the thing, there's no reason to drink raw milk for one. If you're drinking raw milk or any kind of milk for any healing property or any healing type of protocol, that's the wrong approach. You know, drinking any animal's milk is really not the way to do it. However, if you're drinking jelly juice and you happen to eat things that are made with milk, not a bad thing, but let your body heal and seal first. <clears throat> drinking milk on a mutated body just makes your body mutated even more. And then what happens is, is all that bacteria and parasites and everything else that's in raw milk then creates antibodies and then induces immune, or not immune, sorry, hormone, hormones. And so what's the point? It's just a circular type. And then they go do meditation and they go make organite. I mean, I have a person that fits exactly that profile. You know, drink, believes in raw milk and then has friends with naturopathics who are then fixing him whenever he has some issue. And then he makes and sells organite and then believes in meditation for children in school. So you have these children that are highly adrenalized and all you're doing is like giving them Ritalin when you try to impose meditation onto them. Meditation for kids in school, there should be no reason why anyone should be playing with any child hormones. None at all. Okay, so now you're going to zombify your kids with a pleasure hormone. Now they're going to be, you know, a bunch of um, oxytocin-ridden kids that will eventually get pregnant down, down the line. But then, you know, I mean, hey, then there's adrenaline and other types of stuff that gets induced too. And watching movies that are very violent creates hormones. I mean, yeah, everything does. So it's a matter of understanding how this world works. So that way, you know, like I watched a movie yesterday that my husband chose. It was good, but there was a major violent scene that I had to actually like put my fingers in my ears and look away and tell them, let me know when that scene is over with. Because it was a, you know, a, a violence against woman scene. And who needs to see that? Because that, that is a, that, that's trauma. Watching these movies is traumatic to children. Hormones get created. And we wonder why we have now a violent population because now a major hormone like adrenaline and everything else is now the predominant thing based upon what the child is watching. No different than video games, no different than anything that has a, an addiction of sorts. Okay. So, you know, it's more than like, oh, the TV is bad. It programs you. Yeah, it does. But what does that actually mean? Because there's a lot of things on YouTube and the internet on Facebook and people who you hang out with that program you as well and create just as many hormones, if not more, because you're under a false sense of security that is not TV, it's YouTube or it's the internet or it's all your friends that are all practicing crazy meditation and doing sound therapies and gongs and the, you know, and incense and essential oils. The whole thing with the essential oils, I had to figure out what the deal with that was. Oh my God. And that's huge. You know, doTERRA, Young Living, Now, all of those essential oils create hormones. And then that does eventually destroy the body. So even aromatherapy, anything with therapy, you need to run away from. Therapy induces hormones. I don't even wear my patchouli oil anymore. I don't even wear, I don't even touch. I mean, I do have the peppermint oil and water that I like to freshen up my mouth and my face. But that's it. And I said I don't use oils anymore. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I like feeling fresh only because I just like the, fe the feeling of pepper. That's the only oil I ever really have. And I just put that in like a, a large glass jar and I mix it with water. And I use a washcloth. And I'll also use it just to, to brush my teeth with. And if there's stains on my teeth because I'm drinking coffee or whatever else, I have some diatomaceous earth that I put on my toothbrush a little bit and I brush the stains off and that's it. And then I drink my juice right afterwards. Okay. 
I mean, yeah, I could use my juice on my face, but I just like the feeling of peppermint. And that's the only thing that I use, really, that's in the essential oils market. I don't need to do any aromatherapy. If you're feeling bad, it's because you have an imbalance somewhere. But you don't need aromatherapy to balance you out. You don't need to play with your hormones that way. Just get the nutrition in your body and it'll balance it out on its own. Okay? So, yeah, I finally figured out why the MLMs of essential oils exist. Oh, there you go. It's another hormone-based therapy. And the people are taking these things, too, in their body as well, which is, oh, my God. So, um, so anyway, so, yeah. So, spicy foods and hormones and meditation like jelly juice. Yeah. So, really, any type of hormone-based therapy, whatever it is to deal with the pain while you're healing, minimally use it. Don't try to use it so much. I mean, I know people are addicted to cannabis, which induces another hormone because cannabis is part of the endocannabinoids as well as the endocrine system. But I know some of you have a lot of pain, like fibromyalgia. You have major nerve pain. And I understand. And do what you have to do. Some of you have major amounts of eczema. Try to use a juice, but sometimes the juice isn't good enough for whatever reason because it does bring up more stuff sometimes or it could relieve the pain. It just depends. I can't promise you that it'll be a painkiller for you, but do what you have to do to get through, okay? But remember that the goal is not to be turning to these hormone-inducing things to manage a symptom. Eventually, when you get to be 100% healed and sealed, you're not going to be, you know, you're going to be enjoying the different hormone-inducing activities. So yeah, you could smoke a joint once in a while if it's legal. You could go to a concert because that loud music induces a hormone. And I hate loud music anyways. But there are activities that you can do going out to eat like I did last night for a friend's birthday. Eating birthday cake. I had a little birthday cake, didn't eat the frosting because that was just too much sugar. But I ate the cake. And I, you know, and I didn't really drink my juice this morning. I might. But right now I'm dealing with my own healing symptom. So, but, um. So I do things kind of just help me, you know, get by to manage my life. So yeah, lately I've been drinking coffee because I've been feeling really fatigued. So, um, but um, that's because I'm going through a, a healing symptom. And I guess Julia Crisell, she was saying that she went through this too. So she now has very scattered periods herself, which says that, you know, maybe I might have 60 days in between my period. And then the last time I had my period, which was December 8th, it was for like a week almost two weeks, okay, before my period would be like three days, two or three days, and it'd be there, you know, and it would be pretty much like light or heavy, but it'd be like three days, you know, this last time was like, you know, first it was heavy, and then it was light, just like it was when I was like 15, 16, 17, so that's a major difference in how even my period manifests, so we'll see what happens with this one if I do get it, which I haven't yet, and I did initially experienced this last month, hot flashes, which was unheard of for me because I'm not, you know, never had that before. And now fatigue is just the thing. So, and then the brain fog. Yesterday I had major brain fog, which you saw. I couldn't even finish the the transmission yesterday. And I was just losing my train of thought yesterday. I mean, it was bad (laughs) yesterday. So if you want to see somebody that has brain fog trying to then get information out, just watch my video from yesterday. You'd be like, damn. She's just is like rambling and going from one direction to another because I'm not following even my own line of thought. It was just funny. So I'm like, okay, I need to get off here because this is not really working for you. It's not working for me. And But this is where I'm at. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to go now. But you guys just go to jillyjuice.com, J-I-L-L-Y-J-U-I-C-E.com. Get the book. And it tells you just the protocol as well as the science behind, you know, why I say that age reversal is possible. I don't make any claims, but I do say that the human body has the potential to regrow missing organs and limbs and uh, to get your hormones in balance that manifests in these types of different categories out there in the world, as well as um, reversing all counter disease and chronic illness regardless, because you are working with a universal body that has universal symptoms, just different mutations that all of us are experiencing. So, um, and there's more, you know, it's going to be more different mutations, I'm sure we're going to see in the future, hence why we have new and different blood types out there, and then new and different vaccines. Okay, so anyways, have a great day. And then if you want to have your questions answered, 
that's not, you know, um, well, that's that's basically protocol related or whatever, just go to my discussion forum, send us the receipt. We'll give you a login and password. And that is lifetime support. Okay. So, you know, this isn't part of the allopathic holistic world when you're only expending just your time, one book, whether it's an ebook or a paperback book, and then now you have access to the forum. And it's Basically, yeah, it's it's all free as long as you show proof of purchase. Okay, so it, there's not a lot on the website because I really want people to use the book as a reference. That's why the website is very scant in the information. Okay, it's because you really should be reading the book. And we do try to ask or answer as many questions as we can, but sometimes we can't make those decisions for you when you have like a major question or major decision, like should I get a root canal or not? We're not going to be answering those kind of questions. We'll say it's up to you if you understand the power of the body, but we're not telling you what you should do. Thanks, Jennifer. Nice to see you. And so anyway, so yeah, so go read the book. It's really inexpensive. And then if you have other questions that didn't get answered in the book for whatever reason, then feel free to ask those in my website. It's anonymous, so nobody can harass you. That's why I got away from Facebook when it comes to the group or managing, you know, all these different questions is because we have a lot of trolls that like to harass people, but no different than any pro-vax group or anti-vax group, okay? Anyone that has a differing opinion, you're going to be subject to somebody else not agreeing with you, and and they'll be very boisterous and boisterous about it, okay? All right, I'll talk to you later. You guys have a good one. Thanks for listening. Bye.